We only need your your head and mouth. yes, but my head is, is attached to my body, so you know my body needs to be we could at least we could have nothing else comfortable. <laughs> we could make you a little like a little future armor type. Yeah, head. like fl- floating head. I head love in the jar, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's all I that's all I need from you, to be honest. We could <laughs> we could do the podcast, I could keep you in a cupboard, get you out every week. You know, I I would appreciate uh, uh, you know something else. <laughs> <laughs> Drop little you know licorice sticks in there every now and then, <laughs> like a, like a piranha just popping up and <laughs> and getting it. <laughs> I think on that we should leave that in and let's just start the podcast. Uh, welcome to the Non Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrar in the corner with Kumi Hans and I'm joined as always by Dr. Matthias Nordvik. Hello, everybody. This time we are joined by Bob van Strein, who is a, a, um, a student of Old Norse religion and currently um, applying for PhDs um, and uh, has been doing research on various topics that have to do with sort of the interpretation of all of this material and how we understand the source material and also some scholars who have been involved in interpreting the source material. Um, and so welcome to the show, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, and, I was gonna <laughs> say, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. As we've we've moved this a bunch of times, but something always seems to to pop up on both ends, I think. But I, I also want to say you are a one-man Wikipedia of the podcast as well, because I see you in the Discord. <laughs> Whenever anybody asks what episode something comes from, you somehow seem to remember so well um, pretty much the episode, the time. I have my moment. Uh, it, it really started with, uh, there's a quote from Matthias that I've been trying to find. Uh, I still haven't found it, but so I've been going over episode time and again mm-hmm. to find that one quote i thought i had it in the episode with jennifer snook, snook. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's close but it's not as i remember it so it's <laughs> <laughs> i mean let, <laughs> let's get it now something about how academics are supposed to know not just what the sources or what we think about sources but also why we think what we think about them um which i guess ties into this topic of historical criticism and how do we get to conclusions about you know what is nordic mythology what how much can we trust this and that source Um, Mm -hmm. who was the supreme deity of the nordic pantheon if there was a nordic pantheon etc so it's uh so, Matthias, if you want to just repeat that back in a nice little <laughs> quote, then Bob, Bob can rest happy because he's got it there in the soundbite. Um, <laughs> now you put me on the spot. Can I just segue to the fact that that is an awesome ass t shirt that you're wearing, Bob? Thank you. That like Odin pop art. <laughs> you made it yourself. You yeah. should uh, you, you should sell that, man. That's uh, if I, I like like word. Shout and want it. I call it God of Warhol. God of War, all, even better. <laughs> wow, that that is cool. Yeah, I thought it was just like oh, on psychedelics, but uh, I see the Andy Warhol in them. Right, <laughs> that's very that's, cool. That's uh, for any, anybody listening. You can watch the the video episodes on YouTube, so you can check out the awesome, awesome T-shirt, or you can watch them live by supporters on Patreon. There we go. Let's get the get the plugs in. <laughs> nice nice plug there. right there. Um, <laughs> no, I mean. Yeah, it's been a little while since we recorded. For everybody listening, I guess it's just another week, the next week on from the previous episode. But for us, we've had a few weeks off. Matthias, you had a, a son. I'm not sure whether we mentioned it on the podcast yet. I think it's it's been floated out there. I think we mentioned um, you were having a son. I don't know whether we've mentioned it's all... That, that fucking... he was actually born. Yeah, no, that's that's probably true. We haven't mentioned that. Yeah, but... So at this point, he's about a month and some days mm-hmm. old, almost a month and a, well, almost five, five weeks, I guess. And, um, and yeah, he's a real baby. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, bouncing around and stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I say we just take, we took a little bit of time off so you can spend some time at home, I guess. And uh, 
yeah, I've, I've missed recording. It's fun to be back, and we've got some some huge guests, I think, in the lineup. But we're we're getting it back into our recording Tuesday slots, so things are going to be a little bit more regular. Um, and same with those bonus episodes that we do that you can also get exclusive on Patreon, uh, where we do a story time episode and a Q and A episode with me and Mateus as well. So there we go. There's there's a few little plugs out of the way early. So should we just jump into Let's the jump into it? Show? Yeah. So um, Bob, we have you on to talk about the you know these very critical aspects of of the source material and. Dan was like fishing for for sort of like a comprehensive list of of <laughs> all the sources. What would you say are the, like the main sources or some primary sources that are being you know used by scholars that might be a little problematic sometimes? I th- just just to, to jump in and kind of clear up what what I was thinking was the certainly from from my perspective, not as a, a scholar. I think everybody knows that by now. Um, like I guess so much of the so many of the sources have been chopped and changed and translated by somebody else and retranslated and there's other bits added here there and ever I think it's difficult for for maybe the everyday person to to know what is the best kind of original thing to look at as in its most untampered form maybe and I know we we can't get through everything but but I guess for the bulk you're going to get the most bang for your book if you're only going to read five books in your life like I am then what are those five books you should be reading? Bob, go. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, I mean, really, it has to be the Poetic Era, even though it is not a book, but a compilation of poems. Um, but that seems to be the most genuine Nordic material. So, so it, just to get nit- yeah. nitpicky for a second, you point out, this is not a book, it is a compilation of poems. And just, you know, for the everyday uh, non-nerd like you and me, what does that actually mean? <clears throat> it means that um, there was a compiler in, what is it, the 13th century? I think it's about 1270, I believe, who decided, I'm going to put these poems together in one manuscript. And he or she uh, probably did not compose these poems, um, but exactly how they were, well, how, how they came <laughs> to this era is not exactly known. It's probably it's a series of copying manuscripts until who knows how early. And before then, it's supposed to be an oral tradition of who knows how long. Um, I think the closest you can get by dating is, or there's there's a cut of time where we cannot um, date it earlier than because of how the language changes. Mm-hmm. So the material might be older, but in this specific form and. Um, keep in mind that Attic Poetry has set rules on meter and uh, alliteration. So you can't just change stuff. Uh, so when the language changes, everything changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, well, one of the things about Attic Poetry is, of course, that the that, that, that several types of meter that we have in there uh, we have Fort Nidislav, we have Yodahout, Maulahout, and a bunch of others, right? We're about at six or seven different types of Eddic poetry, right? Which also tells you a little bit about calling it Eddic poetry means nothing. It's really just because we have it in a compilation that the people thought had something to do with Edda, which is the book that Snerri Sturluson wrote, uh, possibly wrote. We don't even know that for sure, <laughs> right? Um, but but the the meter and alliteration is less strict than we find in uh, Trotkvite, uh, the skaldic poetry, right? So so that means that there's a bigger risk, so to speak, or chance that uh, things can be changed in the Eddic poems, um, and we see this too, right? We have Snorri's version of the prophecy of the Seeress of Verluspa, which has certain lines that are different from 
the one that you're talking about in the Codex Regius uh, compilation uh, from 1270. Um, but it's the, the, the most important thing, right, is that honestly, we have no fucking clue what this material really is. Like, it's definitely not a religious compilation of texts, right? It's not a, a compilation of texts that were compiled because, because people were like, this is religiously significant, right? And that's really important to understand because uh, that seems to be the thing that nobody really gets nowadays. Like when they're looking at this stuff, people assume yeah. that this is sort of like the true expression of what some Viking has believed in some oh, I've heard. I've had people say like the, the poet header is the Bible. Oh, <laughs> for it's a funny that's, looking Bible, man. That's but, but, <laughs> the, but like, it's Bible-esque, that kind of thing. And I guess even down to, to its origin story of a bunch of poems compiled together, that's kind of similar-ish to, to Constantine compiling the Bible from all these different books in kind of essence, not literally, but that, that kind of thing of compiling a bunch of different stuff to make a, a thing i guess except though that 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 effort of creating a bible back back then right was actually to canonize texts as the true texts telling us about what we believe in and that's that we can't assume that that was the purpose of this unknown compiler of of these poems like we just don't know anything about what their intention was I don't so, think there was so, a consulate of uh, Kapagat where they sat together and they said, oh, we want to keep this poem and we want to kick out the other one. So how do we... <laughs> led, how... led by, 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 by Rakhda Lothbrok of course, himself, of course. Of course. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we not know who, who compiled it? Or is there, is there like suspicions over who or is it literally we have no idea? I don't think we have a clue. I don't think there's a... <laughs> it would be interesting to hear about. Oh, actually, there's a, an author mentioned here in this corner of the, of the page. Um, but no. No, so I mean, there's, there's, uh, all we have is... Um, so, so the reason that this the compilation of poems is called the Poetic Edda is because back when uh, the this Icelandic bishop Brynjölver uh, received the copy or the Codex Regius manuscript in the 1640s or 80s, I can't remember, sometime you know in the 1600s, somebody gave it to him and he looked at it and he was familiar with Snorri Sturluson's Etta. And he could see that the material in this little book which is, you know, the size of a pocketbook. It's smaller than a regular, you know, every man's or penguin classic sized book. Does um, that still exist? What? Yeah, yeah, does it does. Does still exist, the, the, mm -hmm. the one yeah. book? They, they keep it in a, in a tightly locked vault in Iceland. Oh, um, is it not on display? No. I mean, sometimes they take it out here and there, I guess, but... Uh, but they keep it in there, you know, there's these, these books have to be kept under uh, very, you know, s controlled conditions mm -hmm. with the humidity and everything and light for that matter, so that they don't deteriorate. Yeah. But when he got that book, and so that people right, don't eat it. And so people don't eat it. That's another <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, when Brynjölver received his book, he was like, hey, wait a minute. This looks like stuff that I know from Snorri Sturluson's Etta. It's talking about the pre-Christian gods. That's not what he called them, but um, that's what he was thinking. So he, so he was like, this got to be the source that Snorri Sturluson had with him when he read Etta, uh, wrote mm -hmm. Etta. And then he was like, so this is probably from the first historian uh, of Iceland, Simon de Infrodi. And so he called it Simon de Etta. And that's how it got the name Etta. It has there's it doesn't have a title that says this is this book is called Etta or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's um I I just realized that the Bob knows this show better than I know this show because he showed his Wikipedia <laughs> knowledge then by saying don't eat the book. And I was like, 
what an odd thing to say. And then I just realized it's a throwback to when you said that people ate books. Yeah. I was like, you do what you got to do during a famine, man. <laughs> I know. But I I mean, like, it's, it's delicious sheepskin. So if you just <laughs> soak it up a bit and then maybe, maybe fry it mm-hmm. or just eat it as jerky, I guess. Well, I guess it's almost I guess like I, bacon. <laughs> I guess that's the, the thing though. When we, when you said eat books, um to to me i'm thinking why would you eat paper there's no nutritional value to that but then obviously <laughs> books weren't originally made out of paper man i've missed looking silly <laughs> i've and missed the, it and you know i mean the, the, the most fancy ones were made out of calf skin right so that's even more special oh i'm gonna re- i'm gonna try to redeem <laughs> myself i'm gonna try to redeem myself here um if i can remember it i might also make myself look even more silly but it's something to do with say like the satanism and them saying about something oh, I can't it. it's to do with like they, there's a quote in satanism about the skin of virgins and apparently relates back to it's it's meant to be the the, the, the fresh the best skin to ripe to make parchment out of is the they're the youngest calf or something. Is that some shit Alistair Crowley came up with on an acid trip or something like that? It may have been in, it may have been in uh, <laughs> the lesser key of Solomon. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so there's, no, no, it wasn't in that. It was in my demonology encyclopedia book. I okay. can't remember what it is. <laughs> so, Shan, you can just cut that a little bit out. Don't make me look silly. Let's just rewind it back to before I no there is something about that i'm gonna rem- i'm gonna remember it i'm gonna go back to it um but no the so the poet Ekera, we have no idea who wrote it it's a compilation of poems but i guess the fact we we don't know who wrote it, does that mean that it wasn't necessarily popular or um kind of interesting or you know i don't know it, it feels like at the time if it was important you would remember who who made it. So was it maybe just something that was done and left to one side on the shelf and kind of just survived time? Or do you think it was important when it was written down? Anyone? Anyone? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, so um, one of the sort of like, primary theories on this like on why this book exists in the way that it does uh has been proposed by terry gunnell professor terry gunnell at the university of iceland uh, who has basically said that um and so first of all you can see in the margins of uh, of some of the poems um on the sides uh, uh you can see little notations that indicate who's speaking in, and and Terry Gunnell has pointed out that that might be um, that might have been used uh, by uh, by by people performing these poems, um, so so that, that they would know when when to speak uh, during a performance. And so the whole the the, the, the I think probably the main uh, the uh, mostly accepted theory for their existence. And now is that they it, they were simply used for entertainment in the 1200s and the 1100s too probably. Um, I mean the, the thing is, of course, what we can say is that pre-Christian material to some extent was considered uh, valuable knowledge by intellectuals and to an extent also perhaps the general population um, far into the Christian era after people had converted to Christianity. You can see this, for instance, by the fact that all the Scandinavian kings, they <clears throat> have um, scouts or poets who are telling stories about the Nordic gods still into the 1200s, even, you know, even in Denmark, which, you know, in the 1200s has become, you know, very Europeanized, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the funny thing is that, you know, the, the Danish historian Saxo, who's writing in the in the early 1200s, he's he's like literally shitting on Icelandic scouts in in his material while he's using their material. By the way, he's like 
fuck you, jerk. <laughs> like, really? It's like, what the hell? <laughs> anyway, um, so, but that tells you a little bit about what attitudes are also present at that time, right? Like, um, there's, uh, there's, there's definitely an attitude among the clergy in southern Scandinavia that, that, that the, uh, the power that, that these cultural uh, figures in, from, whose, whose cultural legitimacy goes all the way back to pre-Christian times and the Viking Age, that the power that they have needs to be curbed, right? That's what Saxo represents. He's, he represents an attempt to curb that power. But that's the side story to the whole thing. Um, so, so what what do we have? We have, you know, um, two, three, some in some cases, four centuries after the conversion to Christianity, where these old stories are just culturally relevant in different ways. And one of the main ways is for history writing purposes. So we've talked about euhemerization uh, before. This. A uh, theoretical approach that Christian authors will have, where they basically turn gods into or pre-Christian gods into humans, and then place them in a historical context that is, you know, some kind of legendary prehistory to the actual history that they want to talk about. That's, for instance, the first saga of the Norwegian kings sagas in Heimskringla. That's legendary history based off of Nordic mythology, turn Odin and all his buddies into humans and that way they can be represented as some kind of um, ancestral pre precursors to the Norwegian and Swedish kings. Boom, done with that. Mm. Um, and then there's the other way that it, this is also used and that is for entertainment. Like hearing stories about Thor dressed up as, a, as, a, as Freya going to marry a, a troll somewhere, it's funny. And there's a lot of dick jokes in that, so why not? And there you go. So, so that's probably why these poems exist, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's culturally relevant. It's funny stories. Bada bing, bada boom. There we are. Pocket-sized book that somebody had taken a bite of. <laughs> so uh, the big question is, though, um, I guess it's not as relevant to this podcast because this, this is the Nordic mythology podcast, uh, not the Nordic religion podcast. But the big question is, do people believe in this? Or is mm -hmm. this just a fun story? Is it just a fairy tale that you tell your kids, maybe with a, a moral a lesson in it? Um, or, or did people actually believe in what these poems were saying? I, I always, <laughs> I always just assumed that people believed in it because that's kind of what we taught on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, no, no, but but it is, I guess it's kind of just wildly accepted that they believed in it, or really spoke about by most people. Um, <coughs> Jesus Christ, you've shocked me that much. I'm coughing. Um, no, but I, I, I always assumed that believing in it was a thing. Are you going to tell me that maybe they didn't, or maybe we don't know? Well, we definitely don't know. <laughs> that's the easy one um no but it, it's uh it's complicated uh, here he is uh he knows that one <laughs> you know of course he knows that one um no but it's 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 an interesting question i've been playing with the thought of uh most of this is just fan fiction and 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 these gods were the hollywood stars of their time uh, like we have posters of whomever on the wall and billboards and, and whatever. So why wouldn't you have a Gotlandic picture stuff? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so so what does that mean that you say when you're saying uh, fan fiction? Well, the, these these stories that we have available now, they're simply like fan fiction in the sense of like uh, f twice, third, fifth, seventeenth removed stories from stories that were told once possibly mm -hmm. or i mean if if you read uh poetic edda as a script of sort or plays as, as jerry gunnell was saying uh, you can imagine standing in this hall with the fire in the middle and you come on with the with the sudden who mask on where the one eye is lighting up red and you recite that's mm -hmm. entertaining 
it's exciting when you're you know a bunch of warriors in the cult it doesn't mean that they need to believe it um, so i don't know it's a oh it's so you're talking about the concept of, of belief in and of itself like uh, did was this a was this a you know, did, did people have a religious attitude towards uh, these deities yeah. in, in pre-Christian times? I mean, I, I mean, think that that's some of them, sure. Yeah, right. I mean, if we look at how Romans or Greeks, who have left a lot of literary material about what they thought about their gods, and uh, that has fortunately survived, if we go to that material, we can see that there's a bunch of different attitudes, right? Like everything from you know the fear and awe that we get you know also in context of contemporary christianity for that matter uh, to the very skeptical um and and like even sort of like weird uh <laughs> epicurean shit of like the gods are like really the thing that's like in between the atoms and blah blah blah, blah. it's like it, it sounds like some new age shit you could hear at some retreat today <laughs> but also it's there's the like if you will the higher mythology the roman or greek um, but then there's the more everyday religion where they have the, the what do you call them, Latin classes many years ago. Um, and also, I only know it in Dutch, so that's difficult. Um, but there's like these house spirits that you actually pray to. The Lattice. Offerings, the Lattice, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which you might see an equivalent in, in Nordic material with. Landwetter or the little people or whatever, which might be much more day-to-day -day religion uh, than these these you know higher mythology myths of Odin and Thor, especially when you get to Snorre. Um, but yeah. <laughs> you've had oh, it... Snorre and his uh, medieval equivalents in um... ah, what's the Starts with an E. Uh, what what Snorri bases his whole story on? Uh, so, especially yeah, what, Loki. what does he base his entire story on? That's a good question. He's he's definitely got some um, yeah, some 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 opinions. First of all. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I have maintained for a long time now that that the story of Utgara Loki is essentially a missionary narrative that Snorri has picked up. Um, and that's why you can see it in such a weird version in, in the Danish material as well with Saxo. Um, that probably comes from the 1100s. It probably even originates in the Danish area. And there's some linguistic evidence for that in Snorri's version of it. For instance, the use of a uh, East Nordic, not Norse uh, word, Hanski, <laughs> um, that Snorri uses. And uh, uh, what, is the, what is the purpose of that story? It's to, it's to basically expose Thor as a incompetent deity. His power is useless when he is faced with that uh, giant, um, who is capable of making um, these uh, visions for him so that he is tricked by age, he's tricked by the Midgar serpent, he's tricked by all these different things that he's otherwise capable of managing as a immortal god. Isn't it interesting that an immortal god is being put to his knee by old age? Right? Just like Snorri is ambiguous on the subject of whether or not Thor actually kills the Midgard serpent. He has to put that in there. He, he, in his story about the fishing for the Midgard serpent, he says, we don't, uh, I believe that he did not kill the Midgard serpent and it's still out there. But other people say that uh, it was killed. That seems to be a reference to older stories where he actually does kill the Midgard serpent, which would fit with his role in the mythology otherwise that's well, my personal it, theory at least it would fit with um <clears throat> voters that most people know where thor fights with the Jormungandr at the end 
Except that's actually dies. not an original part of the poem. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> there it goes. But the, the original stanza actually seems to suggest that he fights the wolf, <laughs> which is uh, quite fascinating because it actually, and this, this comes down to a little bit of syntax and a little bit of um, um, interpretation as well. But um, the, the stanza where he's like fighting something. It's very difficult to actually know what he's fighting in the end of uh, um, in the end of uh, Verdospa. We just know that he dies. So okay. it is actually possible that he is killed by the wolf. The other thing is, um, and I guess I should shout out to Josh here uh, a few weeks ago or last Thursday um, when he emphasizes that you can't use anything like this to talk about all of them. There, there are no Vikings and they don't have one hairdo. There are no one Scandinavians and there is no one Nordic mythology, mm -hmm. really. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very possible that there's a version where Thor is fighting a snake and there's a version where Thor is fighting a wolf. Mm -hmm. and they could be mutually valid mm -hmm. oh my head hurts <laughs> <laughs> no, because... no but that's such, a, that's such a good point that's such a good point right um and i've made uh, references to this before with uh, sort of like trying to illustrate this with how does this stuff work in contemporary india right you have this this huge landmass with so many different peoples with um who like in a sense believe in the same things but in in a much more real sense don't you know <laughs> we like to call it hinduism but it's a bunch of different religions um that sort of like work more on a continuum right it, sort of like a cultural continuum of like within this fear and at some point you 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 get to the end of the continuum and then i guess you're you're in another culture or or, or have completely reinterpreted something and reinvented buddhism i don't know what um something like that right that's how it works in 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 india and can can these different peoples uh, communicate with one another about their their religion and see eye to eye on a lot of things absolutely could they also use this stuff to uh <laughs> like go into religious war with one another absolutely right so it's like oh this works on all levels right and that's probably the same with scandinavia back uh in 800 and something you have like this this uh one version of of this stuff in in yeah, I don't know, in Jutland, and another version in Jutland, and another version in um, fucking Socken, and so on, right? So, so that's that's how this works. What we can see, though, is that uh, there is some consistency. When we look at place names from the Viking era and before, you can see there's some consistency in uh, different deities that they would all have recognized, right? They would have recognized Odin, because he's got a place name over here in Norway, he's got a place name over here in Sweden, and place name over here in Denmark. Not sure about Iceland though, because they don't have any <laughs> Nordic deities in their place names. <laughs> so we don't know what they would have recognized. Um, I don't know a lot about place names, but I don't trust them. <laughs> they are really bad, uh, them, hard so. to trust. Yeah. They're really hard to trust. I, uh, I I did a little bit of place name studies in my uh, in my master thesis, especially about uh, Vodun place names in England, and the problem there. Uh, can I find it? Um, is that nothing dates from before I think nine hundred, uh, at least as far as we know from the manuscripts. That sounds about right. I'll believe that. So the problem is, was it always called, uh, I don't know, something with Woden? <laughs> or is this a later edition? Um, what is this? I conveniently have my thesis open. So. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Wednesday, Wednesday, 
Collins. Yeah, me, me I too. I've got I've got mine open as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Woodensboro somewhere in Kent, and then place place names with the Warden element after Wilson, 1992. Um, but yeah, the problem is when do you name the place after something? Um, and how long has it been that name before they put it in the manuscript? Mm -hmm. So yeah. how much can you trust that it is ancient or mm -hmm. at least centuries old by the time it's in there? Or would it be I don't know, last year? I mean, there's, there's, some, really there's, there's some interesting examples from, from a Danish material. For instance, there's a, uh, um, there was a particular a place name called Freber um, in northern uh, uh, Denmark, which uh, early scholarship interpreted as a little mountain, but not that there are any mountains in Denmark, <laughs> a little bump in the road that a Dane would call a mountain, um, dedicated to the god Freyr, who would be Freyr in um, you know, some, some later version of uh, Southeastern Scandinavian. Um, then it turns out that someone else dug a little deeper into just, you know, the, the local history of the area and found out that there was apparently like a frog farm there and Fr means frog in Danish. So, so that's why it got that name, right? But I, <laughs> that, that, that name otherwise fits the typology of Freyr dedicated place names in southeastern Scandinavia in general. You can find those legitimate place names dedicated to Freyr, at least according to scholarship legitimate, um, in Sweden, for instance. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how how very wrong you can get when, <laughs> when, you, when you do place name research, right? You have to take a, a huge variety of sources into consideration. Now, with the Scandinavian material, uh, you have a lot of um, um, uh, literature you can actually use for uh, place names um, that will show you uh, the um, consistency and, and also development, linguistic development of the words um, from, in the case of Denmark, it's the 1100s, for instance, uh, which is that time period where you start um, the 1100s is, is where uh, you start seeing the, the major differences in Western Nordic and Eastern Nordic. Um, so what is called Norse or Old Norse and the Danish and Swedish dialects, on the other hand, and some of the Eastern Norwegian dialects as well. They, they split in that time period, right? And so what you can see is that there's some consistency from uh, pre-split in the Danish material in the um, 1100s that you can use to calibrate. Is this actually a place name that is retaining some kind of memory of a deity? Um, in very few instances, you can use, uh, you, can, you can start there. But in most instances, you actually are messing around in the 1600s because that's when you get more consistent um, uh, recording of place names for the purpose, of course, of people's inheritance and that kind of stuff. And, and so, and, and, and in the 1600s, the, 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 the Germans have fucked up our language so much, you have no idea. And it's incredibly <laughs> difficult to actually, <laughs> there's like, just like random Z's everywhere and it's that kind of stuff. <laughs> and you're like, what, what happened, man? <laughs> okay, I, I have a question. Um, but we've got to pull it all the way back to like 10 minutes ago because this one's been sitting on my mind for uh, the last 10 minutes. Um, okay, so we were talking about Thor and the Midgar Serpent and I guess the, the thing that everybody would, would always say as to why Thor didn't kill the Midgar Serpent would be that he fights him at Ragnarok. That's kind of the layperson's when you put everything into these neat little boxes. That's kind of the, the, the thing you would assume. Now, you obviously mentioned Bolaspa, where they, they talk about Ragnarok and how maybe we don't, we can't trust um, the translation. So I'm, I'm right thinking that, that Bolaspa comes from 
the poetic in it, right? Yeah. So obviously, the but also, also, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Stop <that> music <laughs> well. So okay. So we obviously talking about the poetic editor as being like one of the main source materials. That's how we we started the show. Um. So now, like you said, Mateus, maybe he doesn't fight Yomanganda at Ragnarok. Um. So that goes back to like how trustworthy is the poetic editor as a source material, I guess. And then also you mentioned like the translation. So how important is it on which translation you're reading and how much can it vary between translations? Um, Cause I guess you, you, from my point of view, you kind of think, okay, we've got this book sat in Iceland that no, they don't let anybody see. Um, and then you just, somebody just translates it. And then it is what it is. You, somebody trans, needs to translate it once. And then you've got the words on a page now and, and it's, you know, you, you, it's, it's accurate because that's kind of just how I would assume it works. That at this point, we're just able to kind of go, right, that means that, that means that, that means that, and we've got a, an accurate translation. So how much can it, can it differ? Well, Bob, do you want to take this one? Yeah, well, <laughs> I can take at least some of it. Um, I had 10 minutes to think of that. It's been stirring. <laughs> uh, the, the problem is there are uh, multiple versions multiple manuscripts that have parts of what we call the poetic edda. So there's Codex Regius, and then there are three more that have parts of it, if I recall correctly. So one version has that he's fighting the Jormungandr serpents, and one has that he's fighting wolves. Okay. Uh, Matthias, correct me. But, uh, <laughs> I think that was it. Um, and and I guess like Josh was saying about did Vikings wear uh, locked hair? Yes. And but no, the... uh, it's very possible that Vikings, Scandinavians, believed that Thor fought Jormungandr and that Thor fought the Fender's Wolf or another wolf. So, so the interesting... Not... The interesting thing about it, what what you just uh, talked about with like the, is he fighting a the serpent or, or 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 what is what is happening? It, it when you talk about differences in the um, the the versions of the text, right? This this the reference to Thor fighting something and then dying after taking nine steps uh, is stanza fifty six. In Nekel and Kuhn's uh, standardized uh, tradition uh, um, text, um, which is a tradition been used in scholarship, um, and the thing is that that the line that refers to whatever uh, Thor is fighting in the Codex Regius version is, is one one thing that seems to indicate the wolf, and an entirely different line in Snorri's Etta. But it has an entirely different line. It's not just one word that has been uh, sh shifted out or something like that. It's a whole line. So, 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 so this is how complicated it can get. There are also, but, would, but I assume Snorri wouldn't have seen Codus Regi. Well, I'm not even going to try to pronounce. No, he wouldn't Regis, have had. Regis, he would. Of, Regis, of course, he wouldn't. Of course, he wouldn't. There actually, there are things that indicate that the Codex Regius that was uh, compiled in 1270. Um, was compiled by somebody who had some knowledge of Snorri Sturluson's Etta, and that the, that the content of Snorri Sturluson's Etta is guiding the compiler when he puts all these poems together. Also, well, Snorri's is written, even though the Before. my fucking head is going to be so messed up by the end of so, this. Okay, the thing is, so, so Snorri's Etta is wrote written before the poetic Edda is compiled after. But is older than. It's not Edda. older. The text is not older, right? But the material, the content, the content. But then could you the, not say? Could you not say that Snorri's? Yes, you is could. Equally as old because they're yes. using them stories. That's that's the that's the argument here. That's part of the argument, right? Is like the oldest version we have of the prophecy of the seeress is the one that is 
presumably the one that is in Snedder Sturluson's Etta. The only problem with that, and this is another aspect of the fucking complicated aspect, situation here. I need is my whisker. That, yeah, me too, man. Um, <laughs> the manuscripts that we have available of Snorri Sturluson's Etta are younger than the Codex Legius compilation of the Poetic Etta. So we don't have Snorri's original manuscript from 1220, right? What we have is somebody's copy of Snorri's manuscript from 1220 written in around 1310 which would then be 40 years after the compilation of the poetic Edda. <laughs> so uh, these well, poems are both older okay. and younger than each other at the same time. This is just Why marvelous. Does this, this feel like a Schrodinger's cut type situation? It totally um, is. The problem, the, the, the problem so, is, right? Let me, so let me just re recap that. So Snorri wrote the Edda, then the poetic Edda was compiled, but We've lost the original Edda, and but only have a copy of Snorri's Edda from somebody who copied it after the poetic Edda was compiled. Yeah, yeah. It feels like somebody's copying somebody's homework. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, that's the entire basis for medieval literature. You would have monks who would go, like I call them monks, but they could be a lot of different people from the church, really, who would go to a monastery, then they would sit down, then, then they would read, they would read books and books and books, and then they would go home to wherever the fuck they came from, sometimes hundreds of miles away from where that monastery was, and then they would use their memory to write down what they had read in those books. Yeah, it's not <laughs> I feel like people's memories were better back then though like now they were, they because we have like better. like iPhones and everything else our memories suck I you have remember. no idea how good they actually were yeah, at me memorizing this kind of stuff it's 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 fucking impressive uh, impressive sometimes like, okay yeah. my next question is is there any chance that the, the compiler of the Poetic Edda and like Snorri and the, the, the copy of Snorri uh, can they, uh, will they have met or like, is there any chance that they could have seen the original Poetic Edda or are these on completely different areas and it's just a coincidence, kind of like Snorri's first, then the Poetic Edda, then the copy after? So, so the the oldest version of Snorri's Edda that we have available is the so-called Uppsala version. Um, it's called the Uppsala version because it is now uh, kept in Uppsala in Sweden. Um, and it was uh, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I looked deeply into this. It was um, compiled in the 1300s, or was written, copied in the 1300s, early 1300s, in uh, Iceland, if I remember okay. correctly. It could have been made in Norway, but I don't think so. I'm pretty sure this one was made in Iceland. There are other versions. The where was the poetic edda compiled? Also Iceland. So they could have it's very likely it. it's very likely that it probably happened in a, in the same environment that, that is very thought... likely but but it could also be on different parts of the island you it's know. not that big of a fucking island i don't believe it it's not but... that big of a fucking island no and the, it, the the intellectual community of that fucking island would even be smaller right so Ex so yeah there is there is I a only... lot of possibility for crossovers of course absolutely I always assumed that these things were hundreds of years apart. I, I didn't realize that it was so... So what happens, right, is so that and... somebody writes something. Also, by the way, it is completely on basis of that Uppsala manuscript that we assume that Snorri Sturluson wrote, Etta. That's because on the title page, it says in that manuscript, this book was originally written by Snorri Sturluson. We don't fucking know if he ever wrote it, though. So we do not the, know this. <laughs> so, so is that on the cop the copy? That's the copy that says that. So where's the original? The original is lost. Snorri Sturluson's original manuscript is lost. If he ever wrote Etta, and I think there's reason to assume that. I don't think there's reason to assume that he wrote Heimskringla, though. But that's a fist fight 
Hell don't, with some let, Norwegian one day. <laughs> let's not confuse me more. Because I love these episodes, though, to be fair, where everything I think I know is just fucking blown out of the water. Um, no, but this is, this is, Bob, this is the you thing doing? about medieval literature is so incredibly complex for that reason, right? Because, you know, books were so ridiculously expensive that people would memorize so much material and then when they had the chance they would regurgitate it on paper somewhere or vellum not paper um and that apparently you can eat that you can eat which also <laughs> happened which has created other problems for us for instance we will never be able to solve this what if situation someone fucking ate Snorri's Edda? they probably did could have fucking you stopped all of this <laughs> <laughs> it was probably somebody named Hertis somewhere who made it into bacon. I don't know. But the, the thing is that we will never be able to solve, you know, the, this, this situation of did Thor kill the Midgard serpent? Because the other version that we have that, that would actually mention that, right, is Hemis Quilla, the Hemis poem from Codex Regius. And right, right where it says whether or not he fucking killed that animal. There's a hole in the page. Like those, those exact lines have been brought <laughs> out by a hole, which is another problem that you also have with medieval manuscripts. You have holes in them. You have, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that meme or Sounds like censorship on... to me. Well, <laughs> but there's like, you know, there, 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 I don't know if you've ever seen that the picture of a, uh, a medieval manuscript with like a cat that has like stepped on it there's like cat paw prints all over oh. it you know that kind of shit you have actual shit on it bird shit and uh, <laughs> and fly shit you know those kinds of things too there's all kinds of things that have happened to these manuscripts mm -hmm. which also makes it complicated adding to this there are also words in this fucking material that we don't actually know exactly what they mean because we don't have any reference words for them that is especially the problem with uh, the poetic Edda, the poems in the poetic Edda. In certain cases, there are words that we just simply have to guess what they mean because nobody wrote a fucking dictionary for this stuff. And the words have gone out of use since they were put into this material. So we don't, we don't have like later versions of the word or earlier versions that were recorded in another context or something like that. So that's also a problem that we have. <laughs> fuck it the podcast, yeah, I think but... the podcast is over <laughs> fuck it. Like, what, are we, what are we doing this for we don't know anything we know nothing it's all it's all bullshit yeah, what were you saying so, Bob yeah and, and then on top of that we have about 300 years of scholarship uh, most of which has been shit <laughs> uh, to put it mildly so, <laughs> oh, is <laughs> uh, that uh, that complicated as well? Mm -hmm. I, so, I, I thought we would talk about that, but it might get too long to really get into it. Uh, but in a, a clipped out version, if you talk uh, romantic nationalism of the 1800s, where everybody really, really wants to tie their their nation to the Grand Germanic or Nordic past. And then you have Nazi Germany, long Nazi Germany. So let's say the, the 20s till uh, the mid 40s, where it's very important to tie this to uh, a master race. Mm -hmm. And then we're still dealing with the aftermath of it in yeah. current scholarship, where mm -hmm. we, we still try to sift through okay, what is actually good scholarship? What has been um tainted if you will uh by nazis or semi-nazis and that what is does what does it I, even mean right what does it even mean to be tainted too like when is it tainted was it possible for somebody who was a you know declared nazi to to make good scholarship like right and i guess uh, this could be the, the segue to get into what i'm trying to do uh, if I were to get a PhD, um, is I have been 
lurking in the, the archives of the Leiden University Libraries, where they have a special collection uh, in which they have the personal archive of Jan de Vries. And Jan de Vries was perhaps the best scholar of uh, Germanic religion in the late 30s, 40s, especially towards the Pacific. Um, Pacific. And he was a bit of a Nazi, possibly, maybe. Uh, <laughs> possibly, but, maybe. I thought he was a Nazi. Wasn't he a member of the Nazi party? He was not a member of the Nazi party. Oh, cool. He, he was, I stand corrected. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, he has been acquitted of, of, well, never of the Nazi party in Germany, that was clear, but not even of the National Socialist Party in the Netherlands at the time. Um, in the archives, uh, they also have his sort of autobiography um, until 1955, um, in which he wrote that he never joined that party because didn't like the leadership. <laughs> um, so, but he was German friendly, uh, partly because of, he worked together with all of these guys because his scholarship was on the same topic. Um, so he wasn't, at some point he, he wrote that the, the campaign against the Jews he found in bad taste. Um, I mean, that's, that's one way. Which, to, that's one way to put it. One uh, way to put it. Yeah. Um, but probably and, also the, the the strongest way you could put it uh, at the time, without you know finding yourself in a concentration camp somewhere. Well, yeah, but I mean, he wrote this in his autobiography in nineteen. Well, after his retirement in nineteen fifty-five. Oh, okay. Well, then fuck off, man. You could have put it harder than that. <laughs> um, but so he was apparently. Uh, What's the word? Accused of uh, having reported Jews to the Gestapo or, or other Nazis, which he denies, and I, I don't think he did, as far as I could tell from the um, court documents. I guess I haven't been through the entire court documents, but I've read about them. So. Um, uh, it's weird because in his uh, in the verdict they say they do not doubt his uh, I should I should find this quote his um, moral integrity. What they mean by that I have no idea. Um, but so okay, so let me start with who was Jan de Vries. <laughs> that might be a good start. Uh, he was a Dutch scholar. Germanic philology at first um, in the 19, I think in 1915, he has had a dissertation. Um, and then he became a professor in Germanic philology. There's a, it's a very long title, what was in his uh, dossier, the Gothic and Anglo-Saxon and various languages of Indo-Germanic people. Um, yeah, at Leiden University in 1926, and then at some point he was asked to rewrite the Alkermanische Religionsgeschichte, so the big volume or double volume on Germanic religion. Um, so this was in the mid 30s, and then he republished them or he had to rewrite them completely uh, in the 1950s because it was supposed to be reprinted. But then the Soviets uh, in Leipzig smelted <laughs> the, the plates. So we had to rewrite the entire thing. Uh, but that has been the standard work on Germanic religion until, is it last year? Or recent years, the, um, the pre-Christian religions of the North Project. Yeah. It's yeah, I mean, until... Until yeah, until the uh, the the pre-Christian religions of the North project uh, took um, came up, I, I guess, or was conceived of to begin with, I guess. Um, but yeah, the pre-Christian religions of the North, by um, 
John Lindo, Jensen, um, Jensen and, and, and what? Jens Peterschut. And Jens Peterschut, yes. Um, they're the three main editors behind it. Behind they the four volumes of the, of the logical record. Yeah. And then there's the two volumes the, of the other. <laughs> then there's the uh, all the reception history stuff and, and the medieval stuff as well, which Margaret Cooney's Ross is behind. And so it's, it's like, it's a huge project of like multiple volumes um, that has been sort of like the, the purpose is to sort of like supplant Jan de Vries's um, um, alt germanische Religionsgeschichte um, with these, this material instead. So, but there's like uh, hundreds of authors, if I remember correctly, who are involved with that project at this point. It's so like even me. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Is it one chapter or? Yeah, I had two chapters on uh, cosmology and anthropology. Uh, anthropology. <laughs> um, uh, fuck. Um, what is the other? I can't even remember what happened. <laughs> That's been so long ago. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Uh, so, it, was there actually good work done, scholarly, scholarly wise, during like the Nazi kind of reign or that that era? Because obviously, naturally, like nowadays, anything that comes from there or any mention of any link to to those guys, those twats, those assholes, whatever you want to call them, like you just naturally kind of dismiss, or certainly from from like a layperson stance, like you just hear any connection to them and go, oh yeah, fuck that, that must be bullshit. But is it a case of that you have to separate art from artist and there are, is credible work done or is it all bullshit or is it complicated? No, not a question. That is, <laughs> that is what it is. Um, it is probably complicated. It depends on, on what scholar you're talking about, on what work of what scholar you're talking about probably. Um, but that is kind of what I what I want to do with the project that I'm uh, applying with these couple of months is um, I have reason to believe that the police his work may have been more compromised than we think because so okay I did uh, a master's program in Viking and medieval Norse studies um, in Iceland and Oslo. And I was told during this time that we kind of decided that John de Vries's work is solved. We can use it. We know he's he's been involved with Nazi Germany, but his work is good. And so, okay. So, so what is the basis on which we make such assumptions? I don't know. <laughs> that, it's, this is so weird, right? Uh, it, there, there are the ways in which you can see um, that you know Nazi scholarship uh, is sh shit. I have a German. I can't remember what the fuck his name is. A German book on runes and history of uh, of runes uh, from nineteen forty four. That's crap. It's very obviously crap because you can see uh, all the fucking hooju that this guy puts in there. It's pretty pretty obvious if you know this standard history of, of, of runology and those kinds of things. Um, then we have, you know, what I referred to before, the uh, um, the uh, standardized, uh, yeah, Etta, right, uh, by Nekel and Kuhn. Um, two guys who were Nazis, right? Weren't they both Nazis? Probably. I'm pretty <laughs> sure they the, were. The thing is, you, you couldn't be a scholar in Germany no. and not be a Nazi, basically. No, exactly. Uh, and, and you can make a problem about that now, but uh, you couldn't publish, you couldn't research really if you weren't part of or like a member of Nazi. Mm -hmm. I mean then, 
as we, as weird as this sentence might sound coming out of my mouth, and nobody hold, ever hold it against me, please. Um, but is there? No, that's not that bad, Matthias. That's not your face. But is there is there a difference between being a, a Nazi in in quotation marks and being a Nazi yeah. in yeah in kind of actively? Because I imagine you know there, there may have been scholars who who had no choice. They, you know, they, they put their life into work and they wanted to, to carry on doing their work. And the only way to do that was to be, I guess, a paper Nazi. You, mm. you, you, you join the party, but you don't believe in their ideology. You just yeah. go along with it because you want to do what you want to do. But then now in modern times, people look back and criticize you on being a part of that. When you actually weren't, you were just kind of, yeah, I mean, but that's, the, that's that's sort of like the brilliant thing about these uh, open, uh, quote unquote, liberal democracies that we live in. Um, the three of us, for instance, that, that we actually get to uh, uh, do a scholarship and do a bunch of other things without having to be a member of the party. Right. That wasn't the case in Nazi Germany. It was the case in Soviet Russia either. Right. You had to be a member of the party to, you know, be in-house and do uh, basic things that we take for granted today um but and similarly you would have to uh if you wanted to publish in germany even as a foreigner you might have to change your manuscript to exclude certain voices well, that was that was yes. gonna be my other Prince question Jewish Jewish authors uh, yes that, that was gonna be my other question is is these these scholars who may have kind of joined to, to carry on doing their work would there have been pressure from within like the, the higher up of the Nazi party to kind of study things to be in a certain way and produce papers to to show a certain thing that Absolutely. they want to show. That's so, well, if you remember our conversation with Amy, um, uh, what Amy pointed out was that the whole, whole the research on a uh, Männerbunde, this idea that there was like these uh, male warrior bands in in quote-unquote germanic times and the viking age and all that stuff uh that that has something to do with <laughs> the cultivating nazi ideas uh the the i the the, the conversation of uh, about the, the idea of menabund begins uh, long before the inception of the nazi party in germany and austria but it, it becomes uh closely associated with Nazi ideas about the past and at some point also becomes completely taken over by the Nazi party and there's like one way to represent the idea of the Männerbund and this is for instance um, um, is it uh, it's Gustav Neckel who does a lot of research on that right um, Bob um, I'm, I'm not very familiar with Neckel but are I'm pretty you sure he's, Hitler, he's or is that a that would be too easy. Well, there's also Hoefler, but I'm pretty sure that Eiland Neckel or Kuhn has a little bit, uh, 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 has some influence on the research of this. But yes, Otto Hoefler is the, is the big guy on all of this stuff, right? And he he's, uh, he's promoting a, you know, a Nazi consistent idea of, of the Menabund. And, you know, um, they would have an office to where you would send in your manuscript, right? For something, and then they would go go through it to see if it was consistent with the party ideology, and then they would cut whatever wasn't. And if so you then, were too if you were too far off, then they would throw you in jail. Right. So then there's my there's my other question of going back to kind of what I said before is that some scholars they would do what they wanted to do to do what they had to do to keep doing what they loved and what they wanted to do, but then I guess equally is would you still want to do that even if it means you're putting out inaccurate information because i'm sure for, for you Mateus and you bob that that you do what you do because you want to put out the most accurate things possible so is there any point if you're having to to censor and edit it to suit the the party ideology you may as well just uh, fuck you could just go the high dig away and, you just go the high dig away you know high digger was you a, say that like I know what that is. I, I know. Now I'm going to explain <laughs> to you. Uh, Heidegger was a, 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 a philosopher in Nazi Germany. He joined the Nazi Party. That's the main criticism. 
but you know his f philosophy is just a bunch of like funky shit <laughs> really that that uh, that is just so uh difficult to read that uh you, you know i wonder if he he just basically um compiled a bunch of like uh incoherent german nonsense um to <laughs> to to get through living living through the Nazi era, well, and then on the other side of it, he he, was, he came back as a philosopher. Yeah, I guess equally, that's also a way you, to do it. <laughs> equally, would you be more secure as in kind of like your own self preservation as a scholar in Nazi Germany? You probably could, you know. Uh, like, would it have my my point is also though. There's some other things that you need to take into consideration that. You know, this wasn't any different prior to to Nazi Germany. Like, well, yeah, in the Weimar Republic, I guess you had some kind of re uh, research freedom, but before that, Bismarck and Wilhelmian era and all that funky stuff, right? Uh, you had to be consistent with what the emperor wanted to hear. Um, in Denmark, you had to be consistent with what the king wanted to hear, right? The same in Sweden and so on. So, so, so the this the the, the the whole concept of freedom of research is very recent in human history, right? Or we could perhaps say that there, we're seeing some of it in ancient Greece, um, but you know, a consistent application of the idea that as a scholar you have the right to produce free research that follows certain guidelines for what scholarship is, that's very new. Like it didn't exist in Renaissance Italy even though Renaissance Italy produced a bunch of interesting stuff, right? So mm -hmm. it has never really been there. Anyway, you have always had to, you know, follow uh, the official um, ideas about how the world functioned, right? This is also what we see in the 1500s when you then have, you know, the Catholic church in certain countries you know, starting to burn people on the stake for saying things about astronomy and those kinds of things and Copernicus, I don't know, I don't know. right? That's again an aspect of this, right? You, you, you should not veer outside of what is established as the truth. And if you do, then you will have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Do you... But to answer then more specifically on <clears throat> uh, if there were gradations of how Nazi you could be, then yes, uh, in the post-war trials, because they they basically arrested everyone <laughs> in their mom, well not their mom, but everyone in their dad, <laughs> um, and 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 tried to put them to trial uh, in the same way the Fries was in. Uh, in a post-war camp uh, from 46 to 48, um, waiting for his trial as collaborator with uh, the Germans. But so in, in Germany itself, they had a, a gradation system of five tiers where five is innocent, basically. <clears throat> and then the rest is from a uh, meat lover, so like bandwagoner, up to war criminal. And the worst ones went to uh, the Nuremberg court and were executed. Uh, but most people were deemed to be Mittlaufer, um, which at some point, since there were so many <laughs> to, to be put to trial, um, they kind of decided that anyone who joined the Nazi party after <clears throat> 1937, became a Mittlaufer because then the Nazi party had been in power since 1933. And at this point, they you just had to join the party to be a member of the public. Mm -hmm. And that, in my mind, saved Otto Höfler from being an actual Nazi. <laughs> uh, he was a assistant professor in Uppsala in 1933, like one semester. <laughs> he was a lecturer in Uppsala. And then in 1934, he moved to Schiel, or Kiel, I don't know how they pronounce it there, um, and took a, I don't know if he got a professorship there already or if it was four years later, 
when Himmler made his professor in Germanic philology. But anyway, he, he only got to Germany in 1934, and the Nazis had a stop on membership in 1933, so he could not have become a member until they opened it up again in 1937, and he became probably the first member <laughs> of, the, of the new batch. But he has memoirs in which he says that he heard Hitler speak in Vienna in the 1920s, and he was gripped by his words and he couldn't only he could only imagine the spirit of hold on um he's been deep in nazi shit since the early 20s he's been part of the vienna ordner which was the precursor to the sturmabteilung and he's been in the ss on and Airbus since the mid 30s like he's in Deep, deep <laughs> with in the Nazi <laughs> but he was only a meatlaufer, uh, a bandwagoner in his trial. So initially, he was fired from his uh, professorship in uh, in Munich, which he got from him, um, and then he got his position back in 1948, or he got a, a lecturership in 1948, and then he got his chair back in 1950. And then a new professorship in Vienna in 1957. And then he just kept on being a professor for 25 years, I think. Yes, or kept maybe. on being a professor for 25 years. And, so that, but you know, that's the so thing is that, uh, In regards to his, uh, his scholarship, I've got this uh, Viking Way by Neil Price. And what does he say here? The direction of Hofler's research was deliberate in the political climate of the times, but its actual content is generally free from such bias and is indeed of serious quality. Okay. <laughs> what so, the fuck? <laughs> I don't know where Price got that because it's it's not annotated. <laughs> the, that's that section, at least. But that's um, also that's also, I mean, just a statement, right? That's so flilly. Like it, it, it holds. It, it does not hold him accountable for any, mm. any. Well, I mean, this, is, I, this is, I guess, specifically on say there. But it, I don't know. It reads a bit strange. <laughs> uh, it's strange, like, strange is putting it mildly. I would say. I mean, the, the political climate. We know what the political climate was. It was Nazis. Like maybe maybe say that instead of political climate. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but I mean this is this is interesting, right? Because we've seen this with with this field uh, in in multiple contexts. That that uh, you know after the war, several of these individuals they get to basically maintain their positions and and as you just said with Hüffler, basically represent the field for another twenty five years. That's that's pretty pretty problematic. That there there's something that needs to be done there. I mean, there's uh, someone recently finished a PhD on him, and it's uh, Manabunda. Mm -hmm. So I've seen two articles of it. I, I have yet to see the entire dissertation, mm -hmm. but I'm excited to <laughs> read it. Um, I mean, is, I think, is oh, yeah. no go on, Bob. Finish. Uh, I I think. Um, is saying that the, the Mandelbund theory in itself still has some merit, which I find very hard to believe, considering that he was so deep into this whole Sturmabteilung from the 1920s, which is like 10 years before he wrote his dissertation on. So I, I would say that I, I, I would agree with that um, overall assertion that 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 there is there's some some merit to the idea of Menabunda uh, or comitatus um a, a uh, but 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 i mean to 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 sort of like draw up a like a consistent cultural occurrence of these men who go out in the woods and fight each other with sticks and then you know sing songs and devotion of odin or whatever the fuck you think that Menabund is right uh, from 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 you know the year zero 
or maybe even like deep Indo-European times to, to the Viking age, that's bollocks. But what you do have in all societies and cultures, right, is, is, is you know, <laughs> they, they, they generate warrior groups of various kinds. And depending on level of organization and, you know, bureaucracy and those kinds of things, they are more or less organized armies. And can we then see perhaps like pattern of recurring themes, dedication to certain deities, whatever, uh, throughout, you know, uh, at least 500 years and, you know, prior to the Viking Age or into the Viking Age? That's a possibility. It's a possibility to see some of those patterns, but that's very right. different from what Hüffler is <laughs> giving us here. Yeah, but okay, so this is interesting because if you talk about patterns, um, you get to my problem with history of religion as it has become. Because um, some people would call, for example, Jens Peter Schett, the historian of religion. And I have my doubts. Uh, he's, a, <laughs> he's a phenomenologist of religion, um, but he doesn't care too much about if something is historically accurate or if, if a source holds up to a historical standard. Of but also the occurrence of the a phenomenon data. in a historical context, I would say, right. add to this, this uh, should is not particularly preoccupied with when something could have happened he's just like oh it could have happened voila <laughs> so to uh maybe for, for the listeners or for dan if, if he, you know, <laughs> that. thank you um, <laughs> so history what is history um or what is the historical method is very simply you date the source you establish if it's genuine you establish who wrote it establish why and establish if earlier sources were used and how this affected the statement. Very briefly. Um, and history of religion has become more phenomenological, where they say, well, we can see this phenomenon and it happens here, for example, in India. And we have this phenomenon and it happens here in Iceland. And they look the same, so they're probably the same. <laughs> and then we don't care if the one is from 3000 BC and one is from a thousand after. It's just like, oh, it looks the same. So we can probably relate them to each other and, and say a generic thing about it. Uh, and that is what history of religion is or has become largely, <laughs> which is kind of problematic. Mm -hmm. No, that's very true. That's uh, the spot on uh, the major problem that uh, the, the scholarship in, in, in old Norse religion or whatever you want to call it has like because but but there's also the problem that you know you have this eclectic set of sources that that, that are written by many different kinds of people right at many different times as well so what the hell do you do with that if you want to say something about it or is your response then don't say anything about it <laughs> i'm i'm inclined to say <laughs> do not say anything about it or at least have a lot of asterisks and quotation marks and footnotes sidelines huge footnotes, footnotes. everything of like we can't actually say anything about this. But so to have shit as an example, to talk about Adam of Bremen, who you mentioned before, um, he, he says about the temple of Uppsala, that for me, there's no reason to assume either that Adam's description was taken from mythology or vice versa. Both suggestions seem hypercritical. And the parallelism between cult and myth must, in a religio phenomenological, yeah, phenomenological perspective, a priori be considered probable. So he just says, oh, if you want to look at if it's historically accurate, then you're hypercritical. 
Um, <laughs> so let's but, not do that. Also, to say it must be considered probable. I mean, yeah, a lot of things can be considered probable. Fucking aliens having landed in New Mexico's desert can is can be considered probable. I don't know if I would go with probable. <laughs> I, I could give you possible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to me, it's tomato, tomato here. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's uh, that. I think you're you're making a good point here about um, some some key problems in in the re research of the quote unquote history of religion uh, when it comes to Viking Age religion or uh, Vandal era religion, whatever we want to call it, right? What but, What do you think that comes down to? Do you think it's it's a case of just you can't know everything? So because I, it seems like this is something we come across quite often on the podcast that, that there's just so much and it all overlaps and it, it all entwines and weaves together and there's there's different people studying all these different bits that they specialize in and to get an overall picture it's this, almost impossible. This is where I would like to hear Bob talking about Tacitus. And what kind of source that is, because I think that kind of illuminates it a little bit. Silence and a sigh. Yeah, let's talk about Tacitus. So, Tacitus was this Roman guy who uh, he wrote a history of the Germanic people. Or an ethnography of the Germanic people. Um, I have a paper in here. This is uh, by Anderson from the 1930s. And, um, but yeah, Tacitus, I think, supposedly wrote this in 93 after Christ, uh, Christ is written. And, um, and he wrote from his uh, comfy chair in. I think it was Rome about these German tribes. And I think he was in, in Gaul, wasn't he? Wasn't he in, in what is somewhere between Belgium and northern France nowadays? I thought it was um I mean maybe, but he had it seems like he had no first hand knowledge of what he was talking about. That seems very certain, yes. Um so he has been working with possibly eyewitness reports and a lot, a lot of historical sources from that time. Uh, history at that time was, I wrote that down, what is history? A written account of a body of knowledge following a systematic inquiry. So all these Romans and the Greeks before them were very big on writing accounts of what happened when, and oh, there was a war on uh, stuff like that. And they did descriptions of peoples, uh, especially uh, the exotic peoples were very interesting to them. Um, and so what I find interesting is people talk about Nordic mythology and then they say, oh, uh, and Tacitus writes about, you know, the, the German tribes believed in this and that. But the line that Tacitus uses here is, basically a copy of what Caesar said, um, especially the, the line where he says that Mercury was the supreme god of Germany, um, is a copy of what Caesar said, which is a copy of what Herodotus said. Um, but Caesar was talking about the Celts, not about the Germans. And uh, the other guy was talking about the Thracians and not about the Celts or the Germans. So what does that mean? Can we even trust that this is about Germanic people? Or is this just, because religion is such a weird thing to talk about if you don't have first-hand knowledge and, and that could be witnessing it or be part of it. As a witness, that is probably a very different experience from someone who is actually part of a ritual or whatever. Um, so how can we use Tacitus' account, which is a copy of a copy, to talk about Germanic peoples and then relate it to material that is 
800 years younger than us. Nathus. Right. What about it? <laughs> well, that's what, that's what uh, if we go back to a four minutes in, against Peter Schutt, he would say, oh, well, there's Nathus, right? Because Nerthus, right. you can you can authenticate that that name Nerthus is is basically a earlier Germanic version of Nyader in right. the Old Norse language. And then let's break that apart for a second. Will you or shall I? You take it. <laughs> well, I mean, again, we have. Uh, it, it, the same problem as we do with the Eddic poems that I was just ranting about earlier. You have multiple versions, right? You have a, ambiguity in the name. There's there's one version where it's Hertum, which is it does not at all linguistically line up with the other, right? So we we have we have a similar problem here and the reason that we have Nerthus Nyader and that the, the Nerthus version, manuscript version, is being favored is because Jakob Grimm mm. really liked that back in the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> early 19th century, right? So the, that's that's the deliberate uh, choice of a <clears throat> scholar, right? Right. And that's that's really very an, romantic nationalist. Exactly, scholar. a very romantic nationalist scholar who was all about proving. Uh, the Germanness of the Germans, especially in the Rhineland area, <laughs> right? So, right. But I, I find it so curious that so people wrote Tacitus at Germans, right? You know, when talking about Germanic religion, and then that line about, about Mercury, which then supposedly is Odin, um, is a copy from Caesar, who say they worship as their divinity Mercury in particular, and have many images of it. That's about the Celts. About the Germans, Caesar says, uh, the Germans differ much from these usages, for they have neither druids to preside over sacred offices, nor do they pray, uh, pay great regard to sacrifice. Um, what is it? Uh, they rank in the number of the gods, those alone whom they behold, and by whose instrumentality they are obviously benefited, namely the sun, fire, and the moon. They have not heard of the other deities, even by report. Now I don't say that I'm not saying that we can trust Caesar, <laughs> but it's weird that he would say, "Oh, the Germans only worship sun, fire, and the moon." Yeah, that's uh, that sounds and, that sounds almost uh, you know like a stereotyping of uh, barbarians, which is a very common thing in this particular literature, considering the archaeological remains, right? <laughs> in but, you know, the northern German area, the southern Scandinavian area, they definitely had heard about gods and definitely did sacrifices, right? <laughs> right. But how, pro how problematic is it just saying the Germans? Well, like, I, imagine, yeah. I, imagine not, I imagine not everybody believed the same thing. Like, you know, we mentioned before that we're, it's not a world like it is now. It's not kind of so easy to speak to each other on facebook and share I ideas you know you might have people who are 100 miles apart and never have any contact with, with each other share ideas and just have not maybe not wildly different beliefs but they started out at the same same point maybe and then they've, they've changed and, and adapted over time but could could you know could be completely different to somebody who speaks to either either side um so yeah, to I guess be, it depends on who who is he spoke to to get. To be fair, with, with somebody like uh, like Tacitus, he's talking about different uh, what we could call, I guess, tribal identities or something like that. Um, but he's also, if we can identify any of these tribes as like correlating with uh, later populations in Europe, he's he seems to be conflating. Um, what is Germanic speaking peoples with what is Baltic speaking peoples and, you know, possibly even Finns and Sami, you know, uh, to the extent that there's actual real information about these populations in his material. So, so to, to, to him, and this is something that's important to keep in mind, right, to, to Tacitus and Caesar for that matter, like what is Germania, and it's just like this huge region north and east of the Alps and the Rhine, right? That's just everything up there. 
um, that you know th that idea that, uh, in and of itself, of course, doesn't do justice to the populations that exist there, right? Is you know you could correlate this a little bit with like how Europeans or North Americans talk about Africa. It's like this giant continent full of different kinds of peoples, right? But it's like lumped together as Africa because, well, we're racists about that, right? <laughs> and that's how the Romans also thought about other regions outside of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> we end on that note. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we're, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're well over an hour and a half. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Bob, you can come back anytime and we can uh, be, yeah. bring it deeper and just ruin everything I think that I know. That I, I feel like when we, you, when we started this podcast, I thought I knew like the basic stuff and then you blew all that out of the water. So then I went back and reevaluated. You gave me a bunch of books to read. I started reading them and then I thought I knew stuff again. And then you just ruin all that. It's like just a, the whole podcast experience has just been just destroying everything. <laughs> disappointment as as I, disappointment. Yes. As soon as I get, and as soon as I get comfortable in in kind of thinking that I know and I'm finally getting a grasp and I'm understanding what's going on, you you come along and just tear it all down. Well, I mean, so there's something to keep in mind, and that is also that when uh, people with a very critical foundation, as Bob has, I, I had it once too, but then I became deeply cynical. Um, <laughs> but uh, when when they come along and 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 point out all of these uh, critical aspects of the historical basis for saying something about Nordic mythology or pre-Christian religions in Scandinavia, all that stuff, that's fine. Yeah, sure, that's something to keep in mind. However, there is also the, the living reality that we have already reinvented this shit a million times. And, and so we cannot get out. Like we have created a spider web for ourselves that we are like hopelessly stuck in as, as like, you know, these, these helpless flies um, as scholars. So, so that's just how it is. And there's really that that's, it's just something that needs to be continually addressed in different ways and, and reevaluated and is there sometimes any, yeah is there any chance that somebody could just compile everything neatly and accurately into <laughs> but that doesn't you, you that doesn't even to say that doesn't actually even make sense right because look at herodotus and what he did with you know greek history and and, and myth and all that stuff and it's just like we, we, you read that stuff, and you know that's shit. Like you know it's lies, and you know it's all kinds of funky stuff that he's putting in there, right? And and we're talking about somebody who you know invented that way of writing, you know, about peoples and history and and ethnology and you know, whatever we want to call it. So so like, if anything, the project was flawed from the beginning. And we should go back and and yell at the ancient Greeks for 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 screwing it up in the first place. So no, we're we're helplessly stuck in our cultural matrix, man. And I, I I am a very cynical person, but I think if we could just cut out Tacitus entirely, and and just talk about Nordic mythology based on Nordic sources. Or maybe bring it as far as talk about a, a bit broader Germanic stuff, but based on their local source. There's a, a scholar in the, in the UK, Philip Shaw, who did a, a project. Why would you want to do that? On. Why would you want to do that? To stick to the Nordic material and then say stuff about the Nordic material. What is special about it. the Nordic material? It's what I did my master. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I, don't, I don't see the difference between, you know, some lying Icelanders and some lying Roman that was then reproduced by some lying Germans or whatever. You know, it's, it's all right. a bunch of liars <laughs> anyway, right? Why is everyone lying? But, <laughs> but what if they're not lying? What if they're, what if they're telling the truth? 
But if we if we would inside we... the the lying Icelanders or, or Danes, or Norwegians, to the archaeology of their respective places, then we might be able to say meaningful things. But if we need to tie this into a grander scheme of Germanic peoples that's based on Tacitus, which is based on older stuff, and then sort of tie this into a weird Indo-European thing, we haven't even broached that topic yet, but um, then you get this, I mean, we already have a spider web. But what is so special and magical about that uh, artificial border somewhere in Schleswig? Like, wh why is why is that so particularly interesting compared to some, you know, in imagined border in the Rhineland area right. or mm. in Mecklenburg Vorpommern? I don't know, like. What what makes what makes that <laughs> that any more meaningful than the other one? <laughs> I'll have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's a good one. Yes, you, you come back and uh, we can argue over that one. <laughs> All right, let let's wrap this up. It's it's late on a Sunday and my yeah. head is well and truly fucked. Well, you're also drinking whiskey, man. <laughs> that's that's to try and help with. <laughs> it hasn't helped, but but it was to drown my sorrows of, of everything I thought I'd learned in the books you gave me being destroyed. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, it's complicated. No, it's, it is, but it's fun. It's fun because it really opens it up and shows that the I guess we really don't know that much, which I also think is is. It's disappointing, and I think you can look at it two ways. Um, you can be a pessimist about it and kind of be like, "Oh, we don't know anything." It, but I, I think it's almost it's also quite beautiful, and that it allows so much freedom for you for personal interpretation, and to to be able to read read and take these things how you want to do. And maybe it's not a hundred percent accurate, and someone like Bob's going to come along and tell you it's wrong, or worse, or worse, me. <laughs> try and tell you it's wrong but but equally the answer back is you know we don't know and this is the way i want to interpret it which is very romantic i think and maybe even why so many people get interested in all, all of this i say that probably not because most people kind of believe that it's black and white but um for me anyway i, the, I haven't been disheartened by the lack that we know and, and kind of as we've gone along through this show, learning that we know very little. It hasn't, it hasn't put me off. It's almost kind of made me more intrigued to, to find out kind of like maybe what we do know, but also then be able to look at things how, how I want to look and, and, and discuss things. And because I, I love when you get two sides and you can argue both sides and then try and figure out an answer. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, you know, for me, one of the most important things is that people just think alternatively about this stuff. Like, don't go with that Wikipedia version of knowledge about this stuff. Like, it's boring. It's been tried a million times now. Let's, let's do something else, right? So that's what, you know, disappoints me most about, you know, this stuff is like when, 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 we, when we don't get new ideas we don't get it's just a reproduction of the same old blah but i think you know. i think most people it's that they have an interest in in this whether it comes from the vikings tv show or it comes from doing ancestry and they find out the 100 percent viking like i saw someone say earlier but whether whether that's what gets them interested the the easiest source now is wikipedia and it is Kind of these these little websites that you can just get this these stories that come across as being factual, and you don't get the the, the discord of either side and the conversation. You just get that that this is what we know and this is how it is, and it's easy because mostly you know most people don't have time. They don't sit down for for two hours every week and speak to to a doctor of Nordic studies or all the other interesting guests that we get on here 
they they just don't have the access to that so it's very much just they read what they read and take it to be true because they just don't know the rest of it so i don't think that there's any fault or blame to be had on people for for believing what they read because i just don't know exactly they know any it's, better it's the blame is on us the scholars this is why we have people like bob who are holding scholars accountable to what they're saying right that that's the whole point that's the I awesome i haven't point. held you accountable yet i've been... <laughs> <laughs> oh, something, plenty, plenty of things. Slippery something you. you said on an episode earlier. That, uh, oh no! Shit! <laughs> get him! Cut! Cut! Next, cut! <laughs> next time. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's gonna get him eventually. I will. Your academic <laughs> reputation is at stake. So. Oh yeah, well that that's that. long gone anyway. <laughs> no, this, this was fun. Like I said, these ones for me. Um, at the most fun because it's it just changes everything i think i know and hopefully for other people like i say you can look at it one of two ways you can get all upset about it and be, and then because that's the i think the other thing people do is that they it's easier to to just ignore what what the two of you you say on this podcast they might they might listen to it and then hear what you say and just ignore it or I don't want to say discredit it, but maybe maybe they do in their own mind because it's easier to do that than to open up this huge Pandora's box of ifs, buts, and maybes. So it's easier just to kind of fall back into these these nice little neat boxes than open that. So they just kind of discredit this rather than looking at that. Whereas I think that hopefully people should be comfortable. You need to learn to be comfortable in the unknown. And that's one thing I've tried to do over and over again doing this podcast is just be comfortable in saying, we don't know. Let's look at maybe what we do know or the arguments for either side and try and just be, be comfortable there. You don't have to know everything 100%. Um, yeah, that's my worry, is that people may just fall back into what's comfortable by because it's difficult sometimes to question things that maybe you, you do know, I think. You know, some people may have been listening, may have been reading this stuff for 10 years and they've, they've you know, it's very much ingrained in them, these stories. And then you two come along, uh, or not, not just you two, but people we have on the podcast all the time just come along and uh, go, you know what? That thing that you think for the last 10 years is probably not even true. And it probably even is fucking written by the guy you think is written by. And then, so it's just easy to go, yeah, those guys don't know what the fuck they're on about. It's easier, you know. Um, yeah, so I mean, confirmation bias is a, is a, is a general thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, mean, I, I do want to say, in general, like I, I do this Instagram account. And so I have an eye on what's been posted, all these artists that make beautiful, you know, images of, of whatever Nordic mythology. I am very impressed by how well read many of these are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. also the obscure sources and, and it's very well read it's not always as historically critical as I would like it to be mm. but it's I am very impressed with you know their knowledge and then what they do with it artistically as well mm -hmm. um, and something I struggle with especially as uh, someone with a bachelor in religious studies uh, is the difference between what is historical Nordic religion and what is modern interpretations of it. And mm -hmm. I feel like I shouldn't be a problem to anyone who currently practices this and just adding more information. But if they have been stuck in their place for the last 10 years um, and I say, well, actually <laughs> it might not be as clear cut or whatever, then that will in interfere with their by now ingrained belief um, if they are very reconstructionist mm -hmm. uh, people. Rather. Well, I mean, that's, 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 yeah, the problem. But... that's the problem with any, like, you know, religious approach to the world that doesn't want to, you know, see the world for what it is, but like tries to cram it into a box or a category, right? And, you know, a lot of people, they <laughs> gravitate to that kind of stuff because it's easier, right? Like, it, that, that's, that's really it, right? that's it people do 
what's what's easy the, the majority of people obviously you get a certain group of people who who deep dive into these subjects and they want to read all the books want to read all the material but the majority of people they don't maybe they don't want to they don't either have the time or the knowledge to know where to start and i think the scholarly scholarship as a whole probably needs to reevaluate maybe the way that they they put this out and that doesn't mean don't write books but i think you also also need to maybe look at the way that people because so many people just get their information from fucking memes you know how many people get information from memes and it's like if we just made a bunch of memes for the for the podcast they were just accurate and then they circulate they, you get them circulate around and and like like you said bob with artwork but it's accurate information like that's how people most people probably are going to learn these things because they just it's there and it's quick it's quick little little bites here and there but it's accurate rather than all these memes you see on facebook that are just fucking so wildly inaccurate. I so, so th- what i would like to see is in fact a hacker who goes in <laughs> and then hacks all 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 platforms in the entire internet to all redirect to a lexicon so that when you type in your the address for the nordic mythology podcast you just go directly to a lexicon that will give you information about everything or if you type in your, the, the address for the political party that you like or the news site that you like or whatever the fuck it is like now you're that, trying to get you're trying hmm? to get people off the internet i am so much trying to get people off the internet i know that this is like you know sawing off the branch that i'm sitting on i guess because you know podcast but but people really do need to stop talking with each other on the internet and getting their information from the internet they, they need to read a fucking book <laughs> but that that's not going away no it's, it's not it's not going away so therefore i say we as in as if i'm some sort of scholar which i'm not but but we as me being an ally maybe of the scholars need to embrace that and use that to to get the information out kind of and ca- counteract the amount of misinformation there is there and i don't really know how you do it but memes are the fucking answer there because memes are brilliant hey i i i made my norse meme i've, uh, I've thrown in my two cents on that <laughs> and what, no, look what i got from it look what i got from it <laughs> you i mean that's never dying <laughs> that's you, you you're stuck with that but i no i I, I don't know what the answer is but yeah i think it's just making it easier and easier and easier people for you know to get accurate information and knowing where to find it and being able to counteract all the the bullshit because obviously even i haven't watched the new vikings valhalla tv show but you know there's a lot of bullshit in that that doesn't line up historical figures who don't line up like time wise and some are dead by the time the other ones are alive and like that kind of stuff don't alienate future guests man (laughs) yeah no but that but that gets people interested and and into this world but then from there it needs to be taken over to be more accurate rather than the instagram page because i was banned from new age vikings which i mentioned way 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 back and everybody jumped on the page and loved it but there's a new one i think it's called the viking way they they haven't banned me yet so <laughs> if everyone wants to check out way. if everyone wants to check out i'm sure it's the viking or maybe even the viking spirit oh even the, wow oh yeah okay maybe it's not the viking way because that's that maybe it's been the book you showed earlier oh, it, could be. Might, it could be maybe the viking spirit i mean there's um, a lot of things you could say about that book title too and you <laughs> you can put you if anyone wants to jump in there the, the, just some of the stuff is so ridiculous so ridiculous um but the problem is it's so easy to make uh, a meme or a quick post uh with generic information it doesn't have to be disinformation but just generic outdated information and i try to make a post that is like historically critical and it take two weeks to get some sloppily written Nobody mm. actually likes this kind of thing. So if you like that kind of content, go to my Instagram page uh, at Norsefolk. But otherwise, 
Uh, we will we will throw a link for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. no but that, notes that, and all that, stuff. that that that's it exactly. You need people to send people to, to these accurate places where they can get information, and people like you know like Luciano's Children of Ashbridge, like stuff like that, where you can get accurate information, see the accurate artwork from. You know, there's so many cool artists out there that do this work, but obviously Luciano is a, a purist. He you know he's very critical about everything he does it has to be on the nail so you know it, it's making a making all these accessible for everyone i guess so they know where to look and 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 separate the the wheat from the chaff i guess because there is so much bullshit out there um yeah that might have been the whiskey talking for the last 20 minutes i don't know know what i said <laughs> <laughs> no, let's, 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 let's wrap this one up it's been like I say, it's been good fun um yeah i think to summarize everyone just keep an open mind on all of this and and if oh be, be critical mm -hmm. yeah and if you no but it, it, if you're if something comes out that's contrary to what you think just look don't don't just dismiss it maybe just you know listen and be comfortable in that we maybe don't know everything and everything is in black and white and in these neat little boxes there we go uh bob shout out shout out your instagram page let people know where they can find you and your work at norse folks i know i should have called it at nordic folks sorry <laughs> oh <laughs> no if you know if you know how to use the word norse correctly then by all means go right ahead i trust so that's someone like you to be able to <laughs> so so that's norse folks so f-o-l-x yes there we go Matthias at Matthias Nordvig on on Instagram yeah I guess there we, and <laughs> you know now you know now we're, we're, we're back into to our routine or hopefully you know next week we're going to be back into a routine of of our Tuesdays and then we're going to be getting the bonus episodes that you can get on Patreon where we have Jonas Lorenzen doing story time every other week and the opposite week to that, we do a Q&A where people can post questions on Patreon and I basically ask you anything that maybe they've been wondering about this whole And thing. I know they have because they keep sending me messages on social media and that's it. even emails once in a while. So Exactly. That would, well, that's it. So many people must listen to this and have questions for you and they're not lucky enough to be in this position that I, I am where I just get to blurt out ridiculous things when i want so, so you know the, everybody has the question so if you if you do want to ask Matthias something you can join join the patreon um ask Matthias your question you can cancel the patreon after that if you want but it's but literally join, the, the, the the lowest tier is the equivalent of buying me a cup of coffee to ask me a question there i you mean go. you don't yeah you don't get any better than that because how often do people get to ask so, you know somebody legit legitimately that knows what they're talking about that question you know because going back to what we we're talking about before all the all the misinformation um it's you know it's hard to separate the separate it all up and people can just come and ask you and hopefully get an answer to the question that they really want to to know <laughs> shan's telling me off the term people they can cancel after no shan people can cancel if they're after but we offer good quality content. And when they get on there, it's all about getting the people on there. Because when they get on there, they're going to see the amount of back catalog of story times and Q and A's, and then they're going to see it and love it. So get on there and you can cancel if you want after, but you're not going to want to because the episodes are on there. And yeah, just go, yeah. Honestly, go on there. I think there's eight or nine story time episodes on there now. So you're talking 10 plus hours of, of us reading through saga material uh well Jonas reading it was discussing it and then a couple of q a and there, there's gonna be more and more in there and um, yeah and follow us on instagram and facebook man you can find the nordic <laughs> mythology podcast on those platforms youtube and and youtube, YouTube. yeah follow us on youtube too push, push the youtube push the youtube <laughs> yeah yeah bob um, leave, yes. a, leave a five star rating on positive the, review. Yes. <laughs> <Thank positive you. laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I think that's our show. <laughs> well